Hello, and welcome to the Stories That Shape Us with Joanna Daniel. So to, we're continuing our How to Forgive Your Abuser series. And yesterday I looked at Luke 6, 27 and 28, and to see whether or not there was anything there that kept you stuck, or is there anything there that could make you free? And so for the next couple of days, I'm going to just kind of look at some of those words, some of, look at that a little bit and see what are some of the things that you can do when you want to still love those who hate you um, and those who despitefully use you? And there's one translation that says those who abuse you when, you know, in the despitefully use you section, it, it mentions those who abuse you. That's the word that is used instead of despitefully use you. Um, and so when you're a Christian woman or, 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 or a Christian and somebody's, somebody has abused you, is abusing you, what do you do? How can you love them? Does that mean that you stay in relationship with people who are harming you so that you can love them? Can you love them any other way uh, so that you can keep yourself safe? Does What does God require that? Does he require that you stay in abusive situations so that you can love those who despitefully use you? Let me let me just look at the verse Um and just say exactly what it says. Um, and what, what can we do? So it's, okay, uh, pray for those who abuse you. Pray for those who abuse you. So you can pray for people from anywhere, anywhere. So I'm gonna talk about three things that you can do as you are figuring out how to forgive your abuser. Three, three simple, si not three simple steps because I don't want to trivialize it or seem that I am, but just three things that you can do to pray for your abuser um, without putting yourself, without keeping yourself in harm's way. And on this channel, I did a video, I think it was about a couple of years ago, uh, stop praying for your abuser, pray this prayer instead. Because as long as your prayer is not like change them and you are continually in, in an abusive situation, hoping that one day they'll change and they are not changing because God won't take our freedom of choice away. God is freedom of choice is something that's fundamental to who he is. We get to choose if we if we serve him or not serve him, if we follow his directions or not, you know, we get to choose. And so he won't interfere with people's freedom of choice. So when you're praying, just be mindful that it it changes people who have made a decision to allow it to change them. So for the people who are bent on their course of action, it won't change them because they have to allow it in in order for it to do that work of change. Okay, so, so the first thing is proximity. You can pray for somebody and not allow them near to you, close to you, in order for you to pray for them. Because you know, you've worked it out and you know that as long as they're close, this is what they do. There's some people that as long as they have access to your life, they're going to create havoc in your life. As long as they have your phone number, they're going to call you. They're going to be insulting. They're going to be demeaning. They're going to be harsh, critical, and judgmental. They're going to recreate the same behavior pattern that they've done your whole life, as long as they have access. So proximity doesn't necessarily mean you know, living in the same space with them or being in the same town, going to the same church. Sometimes proximity, when you're thinking about how to protect yourself from harm, you might need to change church because going in the same building, in the same worshiping, in the same space with somebody who is constantly despitefully using you, constantly abusing you, that can be really harmful to you. And this is not a cognitive thing. It's, it's the where on the wear the wearing of your body you know it's how the state of uh hypervigilance that your body has to be in the whole time you're in that space with them and the, the harm that is done to your body you know you're, you're if, when you're in a state of hypervigilance you're constantly triggered your nervous system is on high alert nothing you your digestion's not working some of your organs are impacted your heart rate is is impacted as well so if you, can, if you think about what's happening to your body when you do that. So proximity means I'm going to create some space so I can keep myself safe and I'm going to pray for them from over here. Uh, 
so that you can keep yourself safe. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is boundaries. I mentioned the phone earlier. Boundaries might mean they can't also have your phone number. And you might have to also boundary yourself against anybody, family member, friends, or church partners, or whoever, anybody that that um, is in contact because they prob sometimes abusers will try to abuse you through the people that they're in contact with. I saw a post this last week that says that abusers also recruit supporters. So they might have a lot of supporters in your church, in your community, in your friendship group, in your family that they will use to carry on the harm that they're doing to you. So any way they can have access, they will. So some of the things that boundaries might look like is saying to people, please don't share me with me what they're doing. And whatever I share with you, please don't share it with anyone else or share it with them. You might now need to look at how you boundary yourself and keep yourself safe by um, protecting how much you share and what you share to the people who still are in contact and still are, are, are friends with the abusers. Whatever kind of abuse it is, it might mean a lot of, a lot of protection. The people who are demeaning the people who are saying well just get over it don't you know basically the people who are saying don't rock the boat in whatever language they use to say don't rock the boat then you might want to also consider how you bound yourself with those people because when people don't understand what abuse means then when they don't understand then they trivialize it they don't see anything wrong with it they don't see anything wrong with it i was i was um, at church yesterday and people were it was a special day with lots of children and you know everybody has a smartphone everybody's taking pictures and i'm like these children have no rights they can't say please don't take my picture to an adult with the phone in their face this adult is walking around videoing and children don't get to say it because one we teach them that they must be respectful of adults and and two you cannot say no well some children are taught that to an adult so an adult with a phone in your face you can't say no and they're videoing you and you might not like it so i i'm seeing this happen and I'm, i am well triggered the whole time so i speak to one elder uh, a leader and i speak to another leader i thought let me do this so i don't go tell people stop videoing the children so i spoke to the leader and said this isn't right we have a safeguarding we can't have everybody just videoing children we don't know who they are I don't know who they are and so nothing happened I spoke to my husband so he goes speak to the leader sometimes men won't listen to to you when you're a woman they, they just won't listen so and some people feel like they don't have the authority to address certain things and some people just don't take you seriously they think it's you that's being fussy so when you're boundarying yourself you have to think about all of these things who are the characters that are in this scenario that I, or I might also need to protect myself from in the nicest way, right? While you might not have anything against them, you might know that my information is not safe with them because when it comes to safeguarding and protecting, they don't take it that seriously. They don't see anything wrong. They're okay with what's happening. And therefore I need to have a level of boundaries with them too, because otherwise they give the abuser access to me and to my life. So those are some things to think about. Um, no, I, I don't for one minute no, think believe that this is easy. I know it's not, but it's about your protection and your safety, right? So number three is self-protection. How? What are the things that you're going to do? And of course, it's connected to proximity and to boundaries. What are the things that you're going to do to protect yourself? So it's really important to know what do I need protecting? And what are the ways that this abuse has impacted me, that affected my life? Uh, you will not expose your children, for example, to an abuser in the family. You will not let them do sleepovers. You will not let them go for dinner. You won't let them do anything because you know that this is what it is. If it's domestic abuse, you have to think, what do I need now while I am praying? It might mean that I need to do some work of healing before I can even I'm not at the place yet where I can do that because sometimes I meet people where they're, they're busy praying, but it's a, it's a way to not deal with the impact of what this person has done to their lives. Right? So if you are in a place of brokenness and pain, just know that you are worthy of healing and restoration 
and that you can begin to heal and that you you're valuable and worthy of protection and it's important to think what do i need to protect how can i i i don't hate i'm going to get angry on my own behalf i'm going to heal i'm going to find somebody who can walk my journey to help me understand what happened unpack it put it in its right place put some coping strategies in place and one day at a time pick up the pieces of my life from the abuse and the harm that was done to me. I'm going to do that so I can function differently. So that when I pray, I'm praying from a place, not of duty, but from a place of love, a different kind of love. Love knowing who the abuser is, knowing who they are, not expecting any, anything to change or not doing it in a way that you're hoping while you're keeping yourself in harm's way. It's the kind of love that you have for yourself too, because the Bible also said we love people as we love ourselves. And loving yourself might mean protecting yourself, boundaring yourself, creating some distance between you and the harmful people that are in your life. Thank you for joining me in this episode of Stories That Shape Us. I hope you'll join me on the next story.